cooking and eating and food in general and in the South, particularly in New Orleans, it's, it's, it's practically a religion. That was Brenda Buenviaje of Brenda's French Soul Food. I'm Jeff, and this is Storied San Francisco. In this podcast, we get to know Brenda and her wife, Libby Truesdale. Separately, the two share stories of their growing up, Brenda in New Orleans and Libby in Des Moines, Iowa. Their paths crossed in San Francisco in 2005. Please excuse the rough audio in parts of this episode. It's just part of life during COVID-19. Here's Brenda, followed by Libby. I grew up in a little town called Harvey, which is on the west bank of New Orleans, so across the river. Um, my dad was a Filipino immigrant. My mom was uh, half Filipina and half Creole. And when I say Creole, I mean like New Orleans Creole. So basically it's that mixture of all those cultures that make that city. Um, and I, you know, just for ease, I, I usually say I'm Filipina Creole, or if I'm in New Orleans, I might say I'm a Filipina Yat. Do you guys know what a Yat is? No, I never heard that. So yeah. in New Orleans, there's a, 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 what they refer to as the New Orleans dialect is, is, is a Yat, or Yatism, and it's short for Way Yat, uh, which yeah. is basically yeah. how you doing. Yeah. So New Orleanians have been known to refer to themselves as Yats. Okay. Um, you know, I don't know how else. It, it's. It, I feel like my story's a little complicated, and I, you know, I especially lately catch a lot of grief for trying to get people to understand how um, an Asian person would be qualified to cook Southern food. Mm, but okay. those are my roots. Right. And this is who I am. This is what yeah. I grew up eating. This is how I know how to cook it. Sorry, not sorry. Like, <laughs> I'm like, yeah. I don't know what else to tell you. Like, right. <laughs> um, Anyway, grew up in New Orleans. I went to LSU, got a degree in painting and drawing, went back to New Orleans, decided that I really wanted to cook. So I just started cooking. I just got into kitchens and followed people around and figured shit out. Did you cook at all growing up or like were you around your parents cooking or anything? Well, Other relatives? Or anything? Um, well, yeah, I mean, and I've said this in the past, it, like cooking and eating and food in general and in the south particularly in new orleans it's 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 practically a religion you know, like I, the concept of not cooking was <laughs> i'm just I, it did, I, that didn't even occur to me until i actually met people in college who like don't cook I'm like right. what do you mean you don't cook like right. how do you not cook how do you eat um anyway so in new orleans you know with my family um everybody cooked and um, because we were such a melting pot family, everybody cooked a lot of different stuff. Um, I was going to ask, yeah. Did, um, I mean, back then we didn't call it foraging, but, you know, we, you know my, we, we had a boat. We went crabbing. We went fishing. We caught shrimp. We picked blackberries. We picked pecans. We grew our own vegetables. We would catch crawfish in the ditch behind the house. Yeah. Like, you know, that's, that was just kind of how I grew up. I'm I mean, from Texas, and I'm just going to say... I Think you'd agree with me? Gulf shrimp is oh like my, the best. My wife had a Gulf shrimp um, moment, Years what ago. about a decade ago? Because um, I don't know if you've been in New Orleans, but if outside on on the West Bank, a few towns past where I live is um, this place called West Wego, which is almost to the to the actual bayous, and uh, there's a, a open kind of fish market where people who own boats pull up and they have their little fresh seafood stands and we went there and got shrimp that had just been pulled out of the water we went home my mom threw it in the boil and my wife had it was so fun i wish i'd recorded it she had a shrimp moment a shrimp gasm (laughs) she had a shrimp gasm yeah Yeah. i did and i was standing over that it was a big pile of boiled shrimp yeah and just like she was you know showing me how like it's very it's a different approach to eating. Yeah. And you just sit there and really... Actually, we were standing. Like, we didn't even we bother were standing to sit up. down. It was an experience, you know? <laughs> it's not something that you could just say, oh, this is just a meal that I had. Like, it's just so representative of a different way of eating and a different seafood and different style of 
make it. I mean, it was just spectacular. Yeah. And so New Orleans, like so Southern, so New Orleans. It's just crazy. Brenda, do you want to talk about any of the other uh, types of food growing oh, sure, up? That yeah. You, that you yeah. So um, thank you for bringing me back to that. No I do want to talk about that. Um, so we, you know, we, we cooked all of the New Orleans Creole staples, um, you know, gumbo, red beans. My, um, my grandma, uh, who's the one who brought the most, brought the Creole to the family okay. was, uh, part Sicilian. So she would make, um, you know, it's incredible spaghetti and meatballs that would make, uh, she'd make her own olive salads for muffalettas, you know, that kind of stuff. And then, um. There was Filipino food too. My um, my mom, my dad died when I was young, but my mom remarried another Filipino man, um, and so there was pancit and lupia and chupao and steamed uh, sweet rice and banana leaves and you know just all the stuff. Yeah. So it was really like, just kind of you know, matter of fact to me that you know we we had fresh ginger but then we'd have crawfish and we you know just this kind of like melting pot of ingredients always at our disposal and then also like the weird like um uh, american influence uh pantry items like spam and vienna sausage and oh God, yeah. all that weird crap too i mean yeah. just just all sorts of things and you know at any given moment in in our pantry we'd have you know we'd have all the canned things the spam and the vienna sausage but my mom might be like trying to make her own blackberry wine that would explode occasionally and then you know we'd have packets of pancit and you Mm -hmm. know just all the stuff so when i started cooking professionally i you know back that you know this was back in the 90s when um like fusion cuisine was a big thing Mm -hmm. and i didn't realize that i mean it, it just was such a natural fit for me because it is the way that I grew up. Right. But I didn't realize from like an outsider's perspective, ooh, fusion cuisine, you're putting that ingredient with that ingredient. Oh my. And like, that was just kind of a. Uh, because mixing fact. cultures is just what well, we do. I am a mixture of cultures. Right, right. So I embodied it and it, it, yeah. it didn't. It made sense to me. So when fusion became confusion and you know it became the you know the f word of the of the restaurant scene and you know it wasn't cool anymore i was like but you're denying people who are actually like multicultural Mm -hmm. like you know look at hawaiian cuisine so you're saying that's like shitty fusion now right it's hawaiian cuisine so I'm, i'm i'm really happy to see that like it's come back minus the word fusion. Like mm-hmm. it's really mm-hmm. okay to say, "Hey, I'm gonna elevate Filipino food," right. or, you know, "Hey, I'm gonna put um, sisig in a burrito." Like it's okay now. Yeah. It's it just, it was a, uh, I don't know, it was a weird, sh- strange evolution. I felt like, um, but I'm happy to see that we're here now. So er- earlier in your life, before you, you said you went to college for art, and then after that discovered you wanted to cook but um i'm wondering like uh as a kid at any at any point like were you going out on boats and doing or doing any of the like like you said foraging but it was just like were you doing any of that stuff yourself oh as a kid yeah yeah my family we always had a boat right so there was um always fishing um it was always fishing we always had a trawl net so we we would go crabbing we'd catch shrimp um, we would take these long camping trips out on the boat to like these like sandbars and just stay out there and like fish for days at a time. It was wow. Incredible, incredible experiences. Um, and then also in South Louisiana back then, you could, you know, you could drive down to, to the bayou and, and throw your chicken necks in and actually catch like nice blue crabs right. and crawfish. And my, my grandma actually, um, she owned property that had a, pecan grove on it wow. we would pick our own pecans and we would pick wild bl- uh, blue blackberries mm-hmm. like every summer so yeah I, that's how i grew up right yeah so then the other thing i was wondering when it came time when you decided that you wanted to seriously pursue cooking was it ever a question of what you would be doing with food or was it like you know because of your your mixed heritage because of uh, i would think like Maybe you would consider doing Filipino food. I, I don't know. 
Consider what? Doing Filipino food. Like, or, or was it always just, no, <laughs> I'm going to do... It's funny that you say it's that. It's funny that you yeah. ask. <laughs> so... Dun, 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 dun. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> I, um... So, you know, I... We opened the first location, um, you of know, Brenda's. Of, of Brenda's French Soul Food, like, over 13 years ago. And it was meant to be kind of more Frenchy, bistro-y, but... I really let the customers, the people who showed up, dictate what the menu was going to be. And okay. people really wanted southern comfort food. Right. Um, so, you know, I started off with things like fun twists, like uh, stuffed beignets. No one's done that before. And um, some more of the standards, like your gumbo and your red beans. But I had a few, like, kind of more bistro -y things, too, like a salad niçoise and a French onion soup and a croque monsieur. Um, but people really wanted, like, a, you know, shrimp and grits. Like yeah. I finally created a shrimp and grits, and then I actually had, I was forced to put it on the menu by the customers because when they would come in and it wasn't available, they would they would get really angry. Right. So, um, you know, and I, 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 I loved going down the, you know, the southern food rabbit hole. It was just very easy for me to cook because it's how I grew up cooking, and it's, just fundamentally um, how I would like to eat if right. I could eat anything I wanted all the time. Right. Um, but um, you know, it's like it's it's been a it's been a long time of cooking this style of food. Right. And I still love it, and it's I'm not you know it's not going anywhere. But I um, I would like to explore Filipino cuisine, and I've actually started looking. I've actually started playing around with it, and. Uh, I have some pop-up ideas that I'm working on, and you heard it here first. Yeah. <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> <laughs> but I, um, I, I, I told myself that I'm not, I'm, I'm not allowed to move on to another project or cuisine until I write the Brenda's French Soul Food Cookbook. Okay. Which needs to happen. Okay. Yesterday. Can we quickly go back to um, then? I guess you said after college is when you made the decision to cook. Can you walk us through what that looked like at the time? Um, what you know? Sure, you said yeah. you said you got some jobs in kitchens in New Orleans or in New Orleans. Got it. Um, so I was uh, I was you know I just had got my BFA and I was painting, doing some freelance stuff, and selling art supplies and living very poorly and. One of my employers at the time actually suggested that I might look into cooking because he, he pointed out that I actually was, seemed more passionate about food and cooking than I did about painting. And I'm like, okay, well, there's something to this, and what do I have to lose? So I thought, let me let me get a job in the kitchen. And this is back in the day when there weren't many women in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And I actually had a friend who tried to talk me out of doing it. He's like, you're crazy. It's it's hard work it's gonna kill you it's they're so mean in the kitchen la 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 and I was like fine he worked at commanders at the time so maybe that was the case but I I, I did manage to get into a kitchen that was um, being run by a female chef who's about my age actually um, and that was my start and I just fell madly madly in love with it awesome. and I I I should have known because when I was doing my finishing my last year in painting, um, my painting degree, I would read cookbooks cover to cover for pleasure. Okay. <laughs> and uh, it was just this new, fascinating way for me to absorb, you know, culture and history and through, you know, the lens of, of food. So it wasn't just about cooking and eating. It was just kind of like taking the world in differently yeah his, um, history and anthropology and everything yeah. that a cookbook can be yeah, yeah. And, and i didn't realize it at the time i was just you know treating myself to <laughs> reading would cookbooks. you just read them and not cook not anything cook or just just read it yeah okay wow. yeah i mean i would cook like one of the first cookbooks that i read was um frugal gourmet cooks okay. three ancient cuisines and uh I read it cover to cover, and I, I did cook some of the recipes. Like, I remember I would make focaccia often uh, from that book. Um, but, you know, I couldn't read, I couldn't cook the whole thing. But then 
once I read that cookbook, which I think was accidentally mailed to me. Remember those so-called free book clubs where you're like, oh, "Oh, for a penny, and then they bill you $100 every year. Columbia House. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So I got duped into one of those, and I ended up with these um, cookbooks. I I got this macrobiotic cookbook that I read the cover to cover. It was really fascinating, and I actually practiced macrobiotics for about six months just because it was... It was a fascinating experience. This is back in the 90s This is or back so? in college. Okay. Yeah, early 90s. Okay. <laughs> um, can, you, can you now walk us through um, whatever it was leading up to your decision to come out here? And if, if there's other places you went in between. Oh, sure, yeah. Those, those stories, by all means, as well. No, it's, it's good. Um, so I, you know, I, I cooked at a couple. They were all fine dining restaurants. Um, Luckily enough for me, I, the first two chefs I worked for was were um, women, and then the third chef I worked for was a, a queer man who also had a degree in painting. So we really you won the like, lottery. That's... Yeah, we really it hit it off. Yeah. I, it was kind of miraculous, um, and that's where I really um, really got my feet wet. And I moved up. I, I worked for him for about three years. And I started off on the pantry, and I, I left as the chef de cuisine. Okay. So um, I ended up here because we were cooking a dinner at the James Beard House. And I remember we just finished cooking the dinner, and he's like, well, I'm moving to San Francisco to open another restaurant. Do you want to come? And I was like, sure. I was like 28 at the time. And three weeks later, I moved to San Francisco. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm like, bye. Let's That's go. it. Yeah. That simple. That was it. And I had, you know, I had some really good friends who already lived out here who were very excited to see me come out. And uh, I helped them open that restaurant and just kind of moved on from there. What year would that have been? Do you know? 97. 97. And what was the name of that restaurant? It was or the, is? No. <laughs> okay. Do you remember the old China Moon, Barbara Trop? I don't know I if you guys are natives or not. Um, it was on Post Street. I wasn't here in 97. So. Oh, Okay. Well, she, he he took over that space and okay. he called it Mike's on Post. It was very short lived. Okay. But his bigger, more famous restaurant was called Mike's on the Avenue, and that okay. was in New Orleans. Right. Yeah. Okay, we've got you here, so let's go to Libby. Yeah. So, where are you from, and what's your story? So I am a white girl from Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> Does that is that redundant? <laughs> right. I know. I'm like <laughs> too much fish. You're like I was born yeah. with corn coming out of my ears. Yeah. I'm like pork. I'm friends with pigs and soybeans. Yes. Yep. Um, no, I'm from Iowa, and where the food is infamously flavorless. Yeah. Yes, and soulless. Yeah. And very unsexy. Yeah. It has nothing to do with pleasure or enjoyment or you know, savory, enjoying the, the, the unctuousness of life. Yeah. It is very pedestrian and very, um, Protestant and very boring. I was going to say, we already said yeah. white, so yeah. No. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he knows. <laughs> where, um, uh, where in Iowa? I'm from Des Moines, so okay. I'm a city girl. Okay. Um, city girl. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hey, it's at least a French name. There's like a yeah. connection. I don't know. It's culture. <laughs> culture yeah. but I have you know a very close family who are farmers and so yeah. you know we all do in yeah. Iowa so that's where I'm from so when I met her I had never understood that food I mean I understood theoretically that food was supposed to be something that you were passionate about and derived pleasure from mm-hmm. but I didn't really I had never experienced that until right. I met her right, right. so She was the first person that introduced me to the idea of food being sexy Mm. and in different ways, you know, Mm. taste wise and texture and um, experientially, you know, Mm -hmm. as a as a moment, like we talked about the shrimp oil and all that. Mm -hmm. So that kind of was like, yeah, Um, I'm not a food person. Well, I am now. Obviously, I have been for the last 13 years. Um, but I don't cook that much. <laughs> I have a couple of things I can cook, but you know, I leave. So. My mother always told me growing up, because she is a cook. She was very busy in my childhood, so it didn't. 
But she is now, she's an amazing cook. She makes all this incredible food. She told me when I was younger, she tried to teach me how to cook. And mm. I did, was so not interested. I was like, I don't care. And she said, you're like, well, I'll you're get back to that in 30 years. Right. Yeah. No, she said, you have to marry a chef then. You're going to oh. have to marry someone who cooks. Yeah. Or marry a chef. And she was right. So. Did you, do you remember? Um, do you remember any of that? Right. Do you remember her saying that? Oh, yes. Okay. Very clearly. Yeah. Oh, it's a joke in her. She's like, I told you. I was like, yep. Wow. (laughs) Apparently, I do what my mother tells me to. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Thanks, Mom. Yeah. So Um, I think she told you to marry a woman, though. That part she left out. (laughs) Probably not. I think she was not thinking female chef. Yeah. From New Orleans. <laughs> From New, I mean, that didn't, you know. Yeah. I think the woman part was probably the, the yeah. kicker for her. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure the Filipino part was uh, nowhere in sight. <laughs> this, I'm she sure did the, like, not, she did not see this coming. Thing, and yeah. so that you have her Asian babies. I'm sure that also <laughs> right. was not on her on her uh, ver- horizon. But, but at least she got... They love more now than they love me, so we're, we're That's fine. That's not true. And at least in she saw you marrying a chef. You're like, see... Oh, that's, right. I mean, thank God I She'll did, always because have that. the fact that she's a woman then kind of goes, you know, by the wayside. Yeah, it's less significant. <laughs> less important. Yeah. So, you must have grown up pretty much in the 80s, 90s. Yeah, 80s, 90s, yeah. Des Moines. How was that? It was very um, idyllic in a Protestant sort of way. Right. Yeah. It was predictable, Yeah. You know? Did I you, benefited from a good public education and ask, yeah. lots she, she of She literally learned how honest. to ice skate on a pond at the end of her street. She's right. always amazed by this, which is yeah. actually I mean, that was the like same what I read about going like, in your backyard and catching no. crawfish right. that your family boils in a huge pot in your backyard and you all have a big feast yeah. with all the vegetables from your garden, all the eggplants and the <laughs> night tomatoes. and all. I mean, her and the okra, like her mother had this amazingly huge garden, which is a huge part of how she, I think she, you know, internalized how you create food and, right. and make food delicious that she didn't mention because, but, um, yeah, ironically, I did not grow up on, even though I grew up in Iowa, Iowa's a really fucked up state and that it's the most agricultural, most farmed state in the country. Okay. So it has 98% of its Oh, if it's total. Right. Is dedicated to industrial agriculture. So mm. you... You know, and so not food, really. Not food. <laughs> yeah. Food for cows, right? right? We make corn right. for feed, and we make soybeans for China or for whatever. Right. But we don't actually dedicate the agricultural land to food production that goes directly to human beings. Right. It's really fucked up. Yeah, it is. Farm subsidies of the 70s, I mean, and it continually now with Trump and the trade issue with China, and then they the farms got subsidized again. Mm-hmm. Iowa is... Its agricultural economy has a very messed up history. Storied. Yeah. And yeah. it's, I mean, it's the story of America, right? We're yes. going to pay you not to farm your land that you don't actually grow any food that people eat on. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And like, that's the structure. So I left. So you left. Do you? Yeah, so I left. Do you want to talk about, you know, um, did you did you stay in Iowa long enough to go to college or anything like that? Like, what when in your life did that well, happen? Well, I've been I basically from the time I was eighteen moved to the West Coast. I moved to Oregon and then I lived in Washington and then I lived in Oregon again. And there's a I always joke there's a lesbian train between. Okay. Portland and San Francisco. Right, yeah. So absolutely. every dyke that you've ever met in the last 20 years has lived probably in one of those two cities and alternately the other one at some time. And so the stop here is in the mission, right? What's that? The stop yeah. here is in the mission. It's, a, it's the well, end. Well, actually, it's in Oakland now. It's oh, no, Oakland. Right, right, There's right. no more dykes here because we can't afford to live here right. anymore except for, you know, the older ones. What was it about the West Coast that... Being um, from Des Moines, you know, it definitely was the freedom of like mentality and uh, the environment, and you know, nature for nature's sake. And, yeah. I mean, just a lot of things. The progressive politics. I mean, yeah. a lot of things. I just want to, you know, like a lot of kids in the Midwest, you want to leave. So. And I'm curious. Um, everyone has a different story, but, but um, how did you know about that as a kid in? How did I know about, about the West Coast? Yeah, this magical place. Like, you know, was it magazines, TV shows, the oh. inter- early internet? I don't know. I feel like I just was like, where can I go that's really far away? 
And I was like, let's go there. <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't actually well, don't know. Why, no why idea. was it West Coast over East Coast, for instance? Right. Well, I think because the East Coast, I think the reputation of East Coasters in Iowa is probably less friendly. And I think I was young and intimidated, and so I wanted to go somewhere that was very different, but right. that I didn't think I'd get trampled. Right. Right? And how wrong I was, right? I mean, I love New York. We were just in New York, but. Um, and there's part of me that's like, oh, you know, you always have that thing. You're like, I should have moved to New York, but. Yeah. I, you know, Seattle is such a great town, and Portland, I love living in Portland, and San Francisco, of course, is my home, so, and has been. So I moved here in 2005. And had from you, Portland. Had you visited before that in San Francisco? Yeah, I had visited. Yeah. Do you remember for, your first time? I do. Let's I will tell you, that. it's a good story. Okay. Mm-hmm. So they used to hold, um, there's a, a tradition that happened in the late 90s, early aughts uh, around women's music, like punk music, like mm-hmm. Michelle T and the mm-hmm. whole thing and all her touring artists and then all these dyke punk bands, L7 and all them. So they had this music festival in Olympia called Homo Agogo. I've heard of it, yeah. Yes. I don't know if they still do it. I'm old now, but I went to that in Olympia. And I remember there was some, I think it was 19, no, 2003 at Mission High School in the Mission. They held like a smaller version, like the San Francisco Homo Agogo. Yes. And my friends and I came down for the weekend and we stayed in this shitty ass place on Folsom by the freeway like Folsom and 7th or something Okay. and we like went to the Eagle and got all fucked up yes. and like just you know and roamed around town sat in Mission Dolores drinking whiskey out of a paper bag yep. watching the sunset over the city and I was just like this is it you know yeah. like, this is it so a couple of years later I applied to a grad program at San Francisco State Okay. and then I moved here so in 2000. 2005. 05. 05, yeah. Okay. And I met her um, shortly yeah. after I moved here. That was Libby Truesdell and Brenda Buenvi. On the next episode of Storied San Francisco, Libby and Brenda share the story of how they met and decided to open restaurants in the city and Oakland. Please join us for part two this Thursday. Music for Storied San Francisco is by Otis McDonald. Photography is by Michelle Kilfeather. The show is hosted and produced by me. Michelle and I have produced more than 140 episodes over the last three years, and you can find them all at our website, storiedsf.com. While you're there, please check out our store, where in the month of December, we're donating proceeds of all sales to Supply Hope Info, a new nonprofit helping students with distance learning. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, where you can like, comment, and share the stuff we put out. Find our shows just about everywhere you can listen to podcasts, including most recently BFF.fm's new podcast network. Please subscribe to stay up to date on all the content we publish. We love feedback, so if you have any, our email is storiedsf at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Stay strong. Stay safe, wear a mask, and stay healthy. This podcast is a proud member of the BFF.FM podcast network. Learn more at podcasts.bff.fm. BFF.FM, best frequencies forever.